was to join the School of English Literature, Language and Linguistics this year. Um, I've had such a warm welcome from everybody. It's impossible to say a big enough thank you. Um, but I do want to say a word of thanks to the two Jameses, that is uh, Professor James Proctor and uh, Professor James Annesley, and most especially to Dr. Neil Anshabastava, who did a huge amount of paperwork on my behalf to make this visiting professorship possible. So many thanks, Neil And she's also going to be my delightful assistant at the <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got a trip of the movie to show you as well. So, as Neil mentioned, um, today's, this evening's lecture comes out of a big collaborative project that was called, first slide please. <laughs> The Cultural Politics and the Histories of Dirty West Africa, and the, the, the actual project is called The Cultural Politics of Dirty in Africa. And you'll keep seeing this image. I'm fascinated by it. I've been very interested to hear your impressions of it um, as the lecture commences. Um, so, this was a big project funded by the European Research Council between 2013 and 2015, and then by Yale University took it over in 2015. Um, we affectionately called it Dirt Pole. Of cultural politics of dirt, and that's, that's the project team just listed there for you. We had um, two teams, one in Lagos, Nigeria, one in Kenya, in Nairobi. Um, now, the primary aim of the project was to gather urban residents' opinions about dirt in relation to urbanisation. Our topics included waste management, public health, public morality, environmental hazards, and urban planning. And in particular, our interest was in public opinion as produced and understood by ordinary urban residents themselves, um, often in response to mass media like films and newspapers, and in response to government-sponsored media uh, like public health information and education campaigns. <coughs> now, on the topic of media, why don't we let the tabloid, the Sunday Star, try to explain my project? I'm sure British taxpayers will be delighted to learn that 1.5 million has been spent on a study into dirt on a continent they don't live on. Is this really what the EU should be spending our money on? Aren't there slightly more important things in the world and universities could be researching, like trying to find a cure for cancer? It is precisely this kind of bonkers scheme that is convincing more and more people that Britain would be better off outside the EU. Um, so this project has got a dubious claim to fame um, for all the wrong reasons that inadvertently contributed to the Brexit vote. So let's move very rapidly onto the next slide, please, which you'll, be, you'll see why I'll put this slide next. Um, it's from an installation by Yusuf Durabdola, a Nigerian artist we worked closely with on the project. And I want to leave it here for a while um, because it's, it, it, it's got an intriguing complexity that replaces that last comment that we saw. Um, and I'll tell you more about the Dirt Pole project. Well, one of the motivations for this project was a report published by the United Nations um, that estimated an increase in African urban dwellers from approximately 414 million at present to more than 1.2 billion by 2050. According to the UN, African city dwellers are shortly set to outnumber rural populations for the first time in history. Furthermore, the UN estimates that currently 40% of the continent's 1 billion people live in urban areas. 60% of them <coughs> inhabit dwellings with inadequate sanitation and poor water supplies. So we speculated that the topic of dirt, or rather dirtiness, might have a great deal to offer researchers with an interest in how people understood these urban contexts. Between 2014 and 2017, we held interviews with more than 200 residents of Lagos and Nairobi in a variety of languages. And in fact, one of our reasons for starting out with the English word dirt was the way it proliferated. It had a lot of resonance into those local African languages. Lots of phrases, lots of connotations in African languages. And also, um, it had lots of connotations in Nigerian Pidgin English, for example, and in ordinary African street English. Um, it produced interesting differences from British or American connotations of dirt, which are themselves different from each other. So we wanted to find out how particular urban spaces come to be regarded as dirty or as full of dirt. How certain objects and certain people might come to be labelled using categories related to dirt. How, we wanted to know, did local ideas about dirt and dirtiness, how did these ideas shape people's perceptions of the urban environment? Um, in what ways do popular narratives, whether it's um, films or newspapers or other types of popular media, in what way do they contribute to the formation of public opinion about dirt and the dirtiness of others? Well, for me as a historian, and this is where I'd like to introduce the material for this evening's lecture, I was interested in whether it would be possible to write a history or histories of 
disturbed. Such a plural topic. Um, and especially because it would be possible to find any evidence in the archives of ordinary Africans' responses to colonial cases and colonial, um, colonial uh, sanitation campaigns during that first half of the 20th century. Um, now, at this point, you might well be asking, well, why is she interested in dirt rather than cleanliness? Um, I was thinking, how long I thrown out the baby and kept the ball for all the time? Um, and, and in fact, one of the ironies of me standing here this evening um, to give this talk is that money for the Neva Hume. Uh, visiting scholars comes from wealth and out of soap. The first one count Lever Hume, William Hesker de Lever, um, or the Lever brothers, or the Unilever as we know them today, created a global tribute <coughs> out of the production of soap in the early 20th century using palm oil from exactly the, the West African locations that I'll be talking about this evening. What first aroused my curiosity in this topic was something I found again and again in huge numbers of 19th century travellers and traders, diaries and journals, um, British travellers and traders, in countless texts, the same kind of dirt-related words are used to describe local populations. So here's something from the trader John Whitford, who travelled across West Africa in the 1870s. He continuously described local people as filthy and hideous. Everything was filthy and hideous. Not because of the la lack of soap and water, but because of the unfamiliar appearance of people, foodstuffs, locations, this unfamiliarity elicited strong feelings of revulsion in Whitford, which particularly resulted by African shrine priests and traditional healers. He called them filthy juju men, hideous looking juju men. And close to them in revoltingness was this one of my favourite quotes of hideous ugly women, they possess strong limbs developed by hard work which should pertain to man only. <laughs> So other traders adopted a similar language to describe local people's unfamiliarity, whether it was clothes or foodstuffs or physiques, um, all in strongly visceral terms to expressing disgust and revulsion. So one anonymous trader wrote of Nigerian villages in the 1920s. Not only did their bodies give off a horrible smell, but their hair was tousled like dirty rope and their skin a dull black. Again and again, these writers, they present their own negative feelings through the supposedly objective category of dirt, um, as if their feelings are some kind of natural biological sense perception, a natural reaction to dirtiness, whereas really what they describe is a reaction to the culturally challenging norms of other people. Uh, uh, they're, they're describing a breakdown of their own recognition and familiarity. One trader, Thomas Malcolm Knox, who travelled in West Africa with the, the aforementioned William Hesketh Lever in 1924, to visit the Lever Brothers Palm Mill stations. He wrote a diary, and he, at the beginning of the diary, it was lovely to read it because he says, All my judgments are based on the observation of empirical phenomena in Africa. So that's the start of <laughs> So, just like the other <coughs> mentioned, Knox expresses disgust and revulsion, not because of unclean streets or unwashed bodies, but because of what is strange and unrecognisable to him. In, in one Nigerian town, he describes how. He stopped at various native stalls and examined their wares. Capsicum, pepper of a particularly strong variety, food of various sorts, extraordinary and repulsive, all of it. At the Market in Zaria in northern Nigeria, he found the knick-knack stalls were the most curious of all. Little bits of stick, a few knobs of ginger, and little bits of stone, a toothpick or two, all apparently things of no use. Here's the nub of the matter. Here is why I got interested in dirt. It's why it becomes interesting. Because this association of dirt with useless matter, with ugliness, it shows how dirt as a category names things that are not regarded by the onlooker as having economic or social or aesthetic value. Things that are not, in the eyes of the beholder, part of society, regarded as part of society. There's an anthropologist, Mary Douglas, who's got a very famous quotation. She says, from the 1960s, dirt is matter out of place. Um, it, for her, dirt is matter, it's, it's material that should be out of sight, but it's problematically still visible. But what is out of place and dirty to one person may not be so to another. Dirt is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, and on that note, I've got some interesting examples from Kenya we might talk about later, where um, matter deemed to be dirty by colonial health inspectors, like heaps of cow dung, was actually seen to signify prosperity in some places because <coughs> if you measure wealth by the number of cows owned in a household, then a huge pile of dung outside your, your, um, outside your, your house is a sign of your wealth. 
Well, in Thomas Knox's case, the useless matter on those market stores uh, actually describes locally manufactured African products, including lo local soaps and cleansing products, and he simply failed to recognise the products. <coughs> so one could suggest these products were regarded as dirty by him precisely because he wanted to replace them with imported commodities from Liverpool Brothers factory at Port Thomas in Liverpool. So I'll, I want to emphasise at this point that my interest in dirt relates to how people interpret other people. I, it would be very difficult um, to deny the epidemiological argument that our species find certain things inherently contaminated and therefore disgusting, things like vomit, fecal waste. I won't go into too many details about that. <laughs> um, things we avoid these things out of an instinct of self-preservation. But the reactions that I'm focusing on in this project is people's reactions to other people. They can't simply be, be regarded as natural, physical, or evolutionary responses. The powerful physical feelings of revulsion that these traders experience, they mark the moment when they recognise the other's humanity as a consuming, <coughs> drinking, socialising, cleaning, decorating their bodies and their homes, purchasing goods, but instantaneously they disavow the other's taste as unpalatable and crucially beyond their economic control. Um, so with what revolts the traders are thing is the presence of this foreign body as a consuming entity with, with um, participating energetically in the cash and credit economy, but desiring merchandise that's completely alien to the onlookers' trade interests and also their tastes. So I'm not going to use that further precious time with further examples. There are many examples of, of this kind of behaviour, but what I want to emphasise is these expressions of disgust at the supposed uncleanliness of others give us access to a really interesting theme of history of reactionary discourse that continues right through to the present. And if we can understand these strained and failed cross-cultural relationships in past decades, we can also think about how the way dirt continues to operate as a category in debates about multiculturalism and toleration in the global urban environments today. Whitford's identification of African healers as, as filthy in the 1870s, and Knox and other traders discussed about the dirtiness of people's consumption habits in the 1920s. You can, you can see how many decades this crosses. Um, it gives us a historical prologue to an unpalatable side of popular reactions to globalisation and urbanisation. Um, very often these boil down, this is my key point I think, this often boils down to the expression of disgust, the very physical, visceral expression of disgust towards, um, towards things that are not actually requiring soap and water, that are not actually dirty. So anything but natural. Um, so not all British travellers and traders adopted the, this kind of powerful language. Um, numerous travellers in the 19th and 20th centuries developed close relationships with local people. But, but the more I looked at how dirt is used to describe cross-cultural encounters, the clearer it became that few, if any, ideas about other people's filth are connected with people's actual needs to take a bath. So, to what extent did these notions of dirt influence British government policies in colonial Africa um, for public health improvements um, in African urban environments in the first half of the 20th century? The British uh, rolled out rafts of public health measures between the 1910s and the 1940s. It was really an era of sanitary micromanagement in the colonies. Uh, with officials, they literally stepped over the threshold into people's personal spaces with all kinds of regulations about personal practices like the prohibition of animal slaughter within, within compounds, um, prohibition of the burial of family members within compounds. Um, and by compounds, I mean the, the cluster of houses that made up a family. Um, uh, they, they specified the minimum distance between dwellings on private land. They, oh, they also specified the type <coughs> of toilet to be used in urban areas, and more on that later. Um, so I could say a lot more about this, but let me just sum up by saying that by the late 1920s, after two decades of replanning of towns in British Africa, the municipal boards of all the major cities had substantial powers, accompanied by maps that meticulously laid out sectors where thatched roofs were prohibited or where... I hope you can see that okay. It's a, it's a very detailed map. I'll talk you through it a little bit. Um, You've got, you've got the location of, um, this is a map of Lagos from the very early days with sanitary <coughs> planning. It's um, from 1911. Red spots mark, you'll see very few red spots, marking public <coughs> latrines, green spots for dustbins, brown spots for incinerators, 
black spots for the night soil depots where the buckets <coughs> and latrines were empty. If you've got any questions about any of these, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, the blue boundary you see there is the zone where the night soil workers operated. These were the, the people employed to take away the removable buckets from the, uh, from the, the latrines in the various houses. Um, inside that blue zone is where you find the European dwellings, government offices. Oh, you might, can you see on, on the right hand side there, you've got um, polo ground and golf links, <laughs> as well as the missions, the mission schools and the hospitals, all, all inside that blue zone. Right, well, it won't have sketch on notice that the story so far leaves out African voices and perspectives. What is glaringly absent from these colonial travellers and traders' accounts, and what needs to be reasserted into studies of the history of urban Africa, are African perspectives on and changing historical understandings of the cultural encounters that help to shape modern cities and the continent. So, if, but the trouble is, if you want to reach, if you want to try to find local glass grassroots responses to colonial encounters from the early 20th century, you're going to find a major problem. Um, the only available archive for this kind of historical study um, is colonial records. The colonial records often exclude African points of view. When they do include Africans, local people's perspectives are filtered through very often a racist colonial logic, particularly around issues of dirt and dirtiness. So, so these sources are, are saturated with British colonial constructions of Africans. And this makes the possibility of finding non-Eurocentric methods uh, to approach these materials a central problem in any kind of study like this. How can local people's values and opinions be identified in English language reports and films and files whose authors were British colonial officials, often with powerfully Afri anti-African visions of how urban environments should look in order to be free from what they identified as dirt. Well, my way of navigating through these problems has been to try and read the archives for any examples of African responses to government policies, even when these responses are not actually translated into English by the colonial officials who report on them. And so, um, just for the remainder of this lecture, I want to experiment with this method and try to chart a path through the voluminous colonial public health archives. And what I want to try and do is focus on Africans as media consumers, commentators, interpreters, and producers of public opinion. Um, of course, it's impossible to retrieve pristine African voices from these archives. But I want to give you some examples of encounters between government officials for whom dirty African environments required radical transformation and local reactions to the British public health materials that were designed to educate them. Out of these examples, we might like to think more generally about how mass media messages about the dirtiness of others, including the most overtly propagandist type of message, these messages might not always be as clear as they seem at first sight. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Right, you need to imagine yourself in a southern African village on a warm evening in 1943. On this evening in 1943, a British medical officer and his travelling film unit set up their open-air cinema in a village in northern Rhodesia, as Zambia was known, between 1911 and 1964. This is from a lot later, this photo, I hasten to add. But this is the type of tr film truck that they had. They arrived in the village. They didn't need any advanced publicity to convene an audience in this free, impromptu cinema space. News of the arrival of this truck, the film unit, would have, would have followed the truck into the village. Many hundreds of people, uh, at times up to 3,000, and on one occasion, 10,000 people were reported to come from surrounding villages to attend the screenings. Top of the bill on this evening's variety programme in Zambia was a film called Machigaba, completed in 1939 by the sanitary superintendent, William Sellers, and his passion for amateur filming in Nigeria combined with, he, he was also a sanitary health inspector, so um, he, he, this combination of an interest in film and his health interest led to a huge British investment in a colonial film unit um, after the Second World War. And films made by Sellers and his colonial film unit were described by their promoters, they were described as documents of the future for British imperial subjects. They're not only teaching people how to be free from dirt, but as we'll see in a moment, um, how inextricable from the messages about dirt, 
how to be modern participants and consumers in a global economy. Well, Machi Gaba, it translates from Hausa as the village that crept ahead. It was Mr. Sellen's pride and joy. And he was particularly pleased with the film because um, he'd managed to use local amateur actors recruited from Muslim Hausa area of northern Nigeria. And that's where the film is um, set and filmed. It was to Mr. Sellers, it was a perfection of what became known as the Sellers Technique. In fact, by, by, then it all, by 1939, it was already known as the Sellers Technique. This was, quote, a simple story full of human interest that showed, quote, still quoting William Sellers, showed how filth and dirty habits bring misery, poverty, and sickness, and then follows enlightenment, self-help, improved general health, and prosperity. <laughs> so, I can't, I, unfortunately, I can't show you any extracts from Matthew Gabba. It's not available digitally, digitally but um, briefly opens with a, a typical northern Nigerian town. Uh, it's designed to be familiar to spectators. Then it's, the camera zooms in, so the close-ups show the reality behind, behind this... Uh, behind this village, which, to quote Sellers again, um, you see heaps of refuse lying about the streets, untidiness and dirt. Um, and the camera captures all this filth. As the camera captures it, the interpreter of the film, so you'd always have an African interpreter with a loud hailer or a microphone and amplifiers um, into the local language. So Sellers wrote the script, and then it was interpreted into African languages. So what the interpreter is required to say at this point is, look, there's a great deal of sickness in the town. And at that point, um, they, were inter they were required to interact directly with um, audience members. Here is a very dirty house. Who is that man? And the technique, Sellers gave a lecture at the Royal Society in 1940. Um, and he, gave, he said that the technique, quote, is to get the audience to answer questions. We say, what is the matter with him? And back comes the answer. He is sick. The interpreter is required to reply, yes, sick people cannot work properly. The audience is then asked, you're sorry for that man. Back comes the answer. Yes, we are very sorry for him. <laughs> and to and fro go these answers with the information about the connections between dirt and sickness. Repeated, reiterated, back to the audience by the interpreter. Um, so you've got the script runs, yes, he is very sick. The man's sickness, it is more than likely, is caused by all this filth and dirt that you see lying about his house. And a great deal of the sickness in the town is caused by the filth and dirt that people allow to lie all about the town. Um, you can see that Sam's script is like an infantilizing pantomime. And in fact, I'm reiterating that to you now. Um, it's not a genuine Socratic exchange. It's, um, it's allowing one correct answer to each question. And Sam has insisted in his general guidelines for these vernacular films. Um, often it will assist if it contains a few questions involving short and obvious answers for the audience to shout out. I'm not going to ask you to shout out the answers. Um, after all this priming, then, you've got this kind of dirty and foolish protagonist of Matthew Gabba, who, in the film, he lies down in sickness. Um, and the audience is then asked, are you sorry for this man? Quentin says again, back comes the answer in a roar, in a revision of their opening expression of pity. No, we are not sorry for him. Why are you not sorry for him? Back comes the answer. Because he is a dirty man and lives in a dirty house. So that's all been kind of pantomimed for you by Sellers, the Royal Society. Later scenes in Mashi Gabba show, quote, people busy and acting upon the advice given to them by their new progressive district head and his council. They clean up their homes. So that's the sort of happy, happy ever after ending of the colonial script is played out again and again in these films. It's what <coughs> the media historian Dan Rockhill describes as, quote, a futuristic fantasy futuristic urban fantasy of colonial rule. And as in fairy tales, the final, final scenes of Mashi Gamma, it's a land of wealth and health, and I'll quote the script again for you, plenty of cotton and cloth, while the children play and dance, and prosperity reigns. And then the audience is asked at the end, do you want to keep fit and strong? Are you going to keep your town clean and free of sickness? To which the reply is, yes. <laughs> right, so how difficult could the effective communication for such a stark message be? Um, well, back to our scene in Zambia. Each time it was shown in rural Zambia, Mashi Gaba reduced its audiences to helpless, uncontrollable laughter. <laughs> 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 Reporting back on this reaction in 1943, bemused and surprised British information officer in Zambia, he placed the, the film at the top of his bill. Um, he was trying to, to understand the causes of his audience's mirth. He could not understand where the problem lay. This is why I love the archives, because you get this kind of confusion. Um, perhaps, he says, perhaps the type of native character is so foreign to the modern Rhodesian native that he 
Christ and Mohammed, Mohammed and dress amazing. And instead of being taught that clean village life makes for healthier living, he's left with the idea that Nigerians are funny people. <laughs> As a consequence of this failure of its intended message, Magic Gabba was judged the least popular film so far of all the colonial film and productions <laughs> in Southern Africa. But based on that audience reaction, we could equally welcome it. It was a big hit with local film films. Uh, it was unsuccessful in that direct educational messaging rather than unpopular as a movie. The film, it's like it fails to remain anchored in a genre intended for it by the colonial film unit and audiences. This very gets interesting. Audiences seem to regard it as a kind of anthropological comedy. You know, a kind of vision of another African society rather than an instructional story. Um, and the officer in Zambia confessed as much. <coughs> Mashigaba as an educational travelogue would have been successful, he said. Um, so sort of acknowledging the failure of the intentions and the generic conventions rather than acknowledging the failure of the film per se. Well, here's another example from nearly a decade later in the Zambia case. Um, it's across the continent in the house speaking village of Soba in Nigeria. And in fact, um, the film unit truck you see here on the screen, I don't know if you can see on the left hand side, it says Amina's Child. And that's the film I'm going to talk about now, Amina's Child. Um, also, you'll notice, uh, can you see it? It says, wash your hands always on the screen. <laughs> um, so, Amina's Child was screened in 1952, and this was a film about infant nutrition. Believing they are acting in the best interest of their baby, who has dysentery or malnutrition or some other curable disease, um, this, the, the parents of this baby, but especially the insistent mother, take the infants to an expensive traditional healer rather than following the advice of a so called enlightened character in the film who's, who tells them they should take it to the European hospital for treatment. And the scene with the healer shows an, oh, again, I'm sorry I can't show it to you, it shows an obvious charlatan. Um, surrounded by unidentifiable but grotesque kind of fetish objects. <coughs> and it's a common colonialist representation. You'll remember that from that quote from John Whitford in the 1870s, this description of the, the, the filthy, hideous juju man. So in Amina's child, the halo is pictured in a windowless, smoke filled hut, um, waving a fly whisk over the baby in an exaggerated way, and chanting hocus pocus incantations in quite obvious fiction. Now, I want to talk about this example because it's a different kind of dirt to that uh, water pot and rubbish heap from Machigaba. The healer's filth is that of inexplicable or morally wrong, according to the eyes of the British public health officials, morally wrong cultural practices. So, um, again, you know, showing how those perceptions from the 1870s persisted right into the 1940s. Um, I mean, this child then cuts from the healer to the parents return home with the baby and so there's a cut from the baby shown to have died in the road. So in the village of Sova, there was a most unexpected response. And I'll quote uh, the official from the screen here. The whole audience was hilarious when they heard of the death of the child. So the inappropriate laughter of African audiences is such a problem to the colonial audience who funded these expensive educational films that in a survey of the impact of, it was all called cinema propaganda, um, in the 1940s, they, they did a survey requesting officials to quote, give a few examples of the typical sequences that made people laugh. Time and again, in their responses to this survey, British officials explained what they regarded as the failure of film's educational messaging. Um, they think it arises from the incorrect reactions of audiences to um, film techniques, and the film techniques were naturalistic. They were designed to create identification and to draw people into like a typical African village scene. And, and um, so, so, so the audiences were somehow incorrectly reacting to this, this effort to um, create empathy with them. Countless officials expressed concerns, and to quote one British official in Kenya, even slight misrepresentations of native life and customs can change the most serious film into comedy. Moments of great pathos in a film can cause considerable laughter. Another official described in 1940 during a screening in Nigeria of a film about hookworm. Actually, this film was made by Disney. They didn't just make films about cute little animals. Uh, this is a film about hookworm, which you can watch on the Colonial Film Database. Um, it, was, it was intended to, to impress upon people the tragedy which results from dirt and disease. And to the great surprise of film unit personnel, the audience, quote, found it highly amusing, reacting with unsympathetic laughter and ribald remarks. They roared their delighted appreciation. So these audiences, they're partly entangled with colonialism, but they're not defined by it. Um, they're, they're exhibiting cultural self-confidence, 
that colonial officials interpret as a sign of parochialism, failure, closure off from the rest of the world. But if you read against the grain of the colonial archives, you find a noisy stream of commentary accompanying all the screenings. African audiences, they didn't just sit quietly or stand quietly during film displays. Um, officials were often very annoyed. They noted in annoyance that um, audiences provided running commentaries throughout each movie. They filled the breaks uh, between reels with noisy discussions. They reacted to scenes with exclamations, applause, laughter, conversation, debate, arguments, judgment, speculation, directly addressing commentators, the translators, on the topic of the behavior of individual characters on the screen. With few exceptions, the audience responded to commentaries to quote one official by shouting questions at the interpreter, by loud adverse comment, by a hubbub of conversation in their own tongue to each other, trying to make out amongst themselves what is on the screen. Um, another quote, a general buzz of conversation and exclamation would erupt at the end of high impact films. Um, and there's a kind of tragedy here that none of that has been transcribed in the archive. The, the archive kind of resonates with this <coughs> laugh, this laugh, that the archive laughs, but this, uh, they, haven't, they see it as so inappropriate and such a, 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 a such a failure of comprehension that they don't attempt to find out what is being laughed at. But, but we can say audience members were reacting to other audience members as well as to the material on the screen. They're negotiating the messages and meanings of scenes with one another. Uh, and that partly continues today if you go to a film, certainly in Nigeria. These vibrant, noisy, parallel discussions among spectators demonstrated the intensely dialogical character of the African cultures in which these films circulated. Um, as well as you get other, other gender and other types of divisions, sometimes the men in the audience have an argument with the women about the behaviour on screen, particularly the wife in Amini's child, who, the mother who insists on taking the child to the traditional healer. The men in, in one screening of it were accusing the women of irresponsibility yeah. uh, in, as mothers for, for allowing this, you know, so they're kind of blaming the mother. Um, as one re official reported, the audience chatters, interrupts, hisses, anticipates the embrace of the heroine by the hero, or simply vacates the cinema if the film does not meet its standards. I'm hoping you don't vacate this cinema. <laughs> um, so given the huge size of the crowds at screenings and the open-air cinema, um, you've got, you know, those viewer to viewer communications were probably vital uh, to give meaning to the cracked and muffled commentary. If you imagine, I mean, imagine that 3,000 or 10,000 people, you're never going to hear the interpreter's commentary. But William Sellers and his officials showed little interest in the local taste and values expressed in those noisy communications. Even when audience reactions became so loud and unrestrained that, as Sellers complained, they made commentating very difficult, even with the amplifier working at full capacity. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, given the huge cost of the production of these films, by the summer of 1951, the colonial office needed to find out why their <coughs> latent messages about dirtiness and health seem to be failing to transform spectators' attitudes and behaviours. So in 1951, what they did was um, employ a young British anthropologist called Peter Morton Williams um, to undertake systematic research into the success or failure of these officially sponsored films uh, moving among rural cinema audiences. With, he took teams of translators and technicians, and he set out from Lagos, equipped with exactly one of those bands, one of these bands, um, and a selection of films to gauge Nigerian people's reactions to the British colonial productions. Um, the team toured across um, Nigeria in 1952 and they collected, it's a really lovely archive now, it's spectators' comments on the films which they've translated and transcribed. <coughs> so on arriving in a village, they'd, they'd arranged their films in a programme, they'd briefed the commentator and they'd, um, what they did was they mingled with the audience during the film. So they'd note which particular scenes or character types of techniques caused collective reactions like you know, amazement or consternation or laughter. And they eavesdropped on individual spectators as well during, um, during screenings and then transcribed their comments. They interviewed small groups of adults before and after the, the films. And um, they also got school children to write synopses of the favourite films from the previous night's programme to see what had stuck into the next day. So local languages were the medium for most of these communications. And that archive is crucial to my research into local audiences. It's really for the first time in colonial history, West African audiences of all ages and backgrounds were invited to describe their responses to imported mass media content. Um, and, and research into the causes of laughter was deemed essential by that point. Why the colonial office needed to know? Why did, why did African spectators laugh at such inappropriate moments in movies? Um, so, let's think about that. Numerous members of Morton Williams' audience, young people, married people, unmarried, mature women, men, 
Muslims, Christians, people from all the language groups included in his study, they all laughed at the scene in Amina's child, where the baby is found to have died after its expensive trip to the healer. Um, the infant's death caused such havoc in one village that Morton Williams reported, quote, the film had to be stopped during this scene to reorder the audience. So many British officers in the 1930s and 40s, they would have concluded that these audiences were laughing barbarically at the dead baby and its sobbing mother. It's such a tragic scene. But what's striking about the unanimous Nigerian reaction to this film was the importance of local notions about appropriate and foolish behaviour. So the death of the baby, it clearly shows Aminu and his wife to have made a bad decision to visit that particular healer. Audience members in one village were overheard to say it's just what they deserved. If they haven't any sense, they must put up with it. What sort of fuss? as translated. Um, this doesn't necessarily show acceptance of the film's public health message, um, but people's laughter really did seem to be aimed at these stupid parents for visiting an incompetent healer. They laughed. They were proven right to be, you know, that opening scene I described. It's such a caricature of the charlatan healer. But people were, th their reaction was proven correct by the narrative trajectory of the film. So th their laughter was a public affirmation that their assumptions were accurate. Um, and that their running commentaries through the film were accurate about the foolishness of these parents for consulting this particular doctor who is clearly portrayed as a fake. So this kind of educational parable designed by the colonial film unit, it was like, it was parabolized, it was still a parable. It's made a parable by the Nigerian audiences, but a completely different shape to the intended one from the British makers, um, meaning given to details that were deemed irrelevant by the officials. So as Morton Williams commented of Yoruba audiences, Amini's child was ineffectual in his <coughs> message. His lengthy sermon on public health and child nutrition was entirely overlooked by audiences. Rather, the parents' folly um, was filled with local explanations about infant mortality, nutrition, etc. So spectators' laughter exhibited a confident capacity to cross-reference film with existing, this is hardly surprising, uh, with existing moral and spiritual narratives. You know, films were incorporated into local contexts, um, local narrative conventions, and, and so the propagandist power was diluted, or if not neutralised altogether. Um, the interesting thing about Morton Williams's research into Yoruba laughter at the baby's death, it also raised technical factors relating to filmmaking and poor acting above cultural, spiritual or sociological explanations. So after screening in um, numerous villages, people commented, quote, there was a note of false sorrow on the screen through inadequate acting. Uh, second, the mother was foolish in the view of many spectators, as I've said, for refusing to take her child to hospital. So many, many jeered at her folly. And third, this is quoting Morton Williams, the sudden cut from Aminu and the mother walking away from the diviner with the living child to their arrival home carrying the dead child was startling, triggering laughter. So the audiences, they recognised the sort of forced naturalism of this educational parable of the, of the propaganda. They applied the principles of existing genres like folk tales, proverbs, um, in which foolishness is often jeered at rather than pitied. And they reacted to editing techniques in the studio. So unlike all the colonial filmmakers like Sellers in that kind of pantomime that I reported earlier, you know, they constructed African village dwellers as naive, gullible, susceptible to the propaganda power <coughs> of naturalistic films. But, but Morton Williams's audiences recognised and commented on film techniques and genres they critiqued the structure of films, and in doing so, they comprehensively overturned the truth or reality claimed for the, this media by the filmmakers. Um, well, Morton Williams's team also noted how audience members assembled in different places. There's all kinds of really interesting material about who sat where. In particular, um, they, they noticed that in all screenings, the children sat right at the front, and it's a huge screen, so children sat right at the front with their necks craned up to the screen. And um, this creates an interesting problem for uh, historians of film like me, because when we interviewed the only surviving audience members from these films, they were children at the time. So um, you get this child's eye view, like a neck craned up, uh, not able to see the whole screen and very distorted sound. OK, well, I want to draw to an end by showing you a clip from one of these public health movies, as if you haven't heard enough about them. Um, it's a final scene of a film made in 1949, so quite late in this era of uh, propaganda films. It's set in colonial Zimbabwe, and it's called Wives of Mendy. And um, this film, I'll just quickly fill you in, the successful, we could, that's it, thank you. We, um, the successful transformation of Mendy and his wives from dirty uh, domestic habits to clean ones 
it's marked by some other distinctive changes that are not connected to dirtiness per se. So, so this is going to bring me back round to the points I was making at the start of the lecture about the absence of dirt from bodies that are deemed to be dirty. So um, uh, we're going to play you a two, just a two-minute clip. And look for how the opposite of dirt is represented. Look for the signs of change in lifestyle and consumption alongside the improvements in clean... His wife. After the greetings were over, my aunt Fowey told Nendi what my and Gwendy had said and asked if they might make his home more comfortable. Certainly, said Nendi, and told his wives to go with the three women. And so it all started. One of the women showed how easily the outside could be swept up and made tidy, and the second wife watched and helped. <coughs> My aunt Fowey showed the youngest wife how best to wash her husband's clothes properly and well, and explain how easy it could be once you knew how. <coughs> and so that wife took over. And before long, all Nindy's things were hanging out, cleaner than they had been for a long time. Nindy's first wife was shown by the other woman how to cook a really good meal that would be enjoyed by everybody by the new simple methods. All this, and much more beside, was done that day. And toward the end of the day, when Nindy came to see what had been done, he hardly recognized his house or its surroundings, and his evening meal smelt more appetizing than ever before. <laughs> he began to see how much could be done, and realized that my father's ideas were worth supporting. He was full of praise for what had happened, and told his wives that they were to join the club and always to work in the new way. And they obeyed him. And so, thanks to my father, it was not long before Nendi and his wives found themselves living in such cleanliness and comfort as they had never realized was possible <laughs> for ordinary people. And life was happy in the village again. Thanks, Neelam. <laughs> well, doesn't need explaining, really, does it? The tea drinking scene with Captain Sosley. Wow, and then he wags. He's got an English voiceover. It's, um, you know, and, and did you notice Nendi's transformation out of the grass? Mm -hmm. It's the suit, the grass, not the <coughs> this, is all, this is all part of that, that message that I, I'm trying to sort of unpick about how dirtiness is not connected to the need to wash, as though it's latched it onto it, but it's not completely connected to it. At the end, um, if, yes, if you could just have the next slide, please. At the end of the film, there's a cake-making competition, a kind of great South African bake-off uh, for the African lads, <laughs> and um, only the husbands get to taste the women cake. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's all very clear. Now, when Mar 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 was screened by Morton Williams in Nigeria in the 1950s, viewers were amazed by the tea drinking scene. They were exclaiming, they've become Europeans at the site of the tea party, and they laughed loudly and continuously, as they did, you did, throughout the closing scene of the final part of the film, um, especially at the men in suits and ties who eat the cake in the closing shots. So you can see um, you can see how the topic of dirt was harnessed to much wider lifestyle messages than simply uh, hygiene, um, inextricable from ideas about the superiority of British, I mean, British imperialist 1950s vision, 40s, 50s vision of home life. You can judge the success or failure of this film by the audience response. Okay, well, I'm going to draw to a close now. And just to say that, well, one thing, um, one thing is clear, that the, the, these films, these kind of film producers, their intended public health message in films like this, failed to achieve their objective among the intended audiences. You know, the, the audience responses don't <coughs> demonstrate the category of dirt. It did not stick to its subjects. Um, so among the findings of that project is a very unsurprising and commonsensical discovery that in West Africa, as elsewhere, public opinion has a life of its own. Media messages can't be interpreted separately from media consumers. And even the most blatant propaganda, like colonial public health films, will not necessarily communicate messages in an unmediated form. And another key finding is that dirtiness is not simply the opposite of cleanliness. Um, dirt has a history or histories of its own that have different trajectories from a history of say, soap or sanitation. <coughs> dirt is far more than an empirical substance. It's also an interpretive category. It often operates through the opposition of um, clean self, the dirty other, and 
as such, it has a place in history um, as a category of interpretation. Dirt, it has this kind of vibrant historicity. It, it persists through the decades. It changes with the times, but it often affects how the bodies of people are seen and described by those with the power to tell stories and to be heard in a hearable context. And I'll, I'll stop there and I'll welcome your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, can you please um, wave to one of the two people who have the mics and we'll take questions? Can you speak loudly into the mic so everybody can hear your question, please? Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask, is there any evidence of the anthropological research? feeding back into the filmmaking teams and whether they corrected it or not, whether they were being used by the findings, were resistant to the findings, or altered things accordingly? Okay, that's a brilliant question. Um, has anyone ever seen the film Sanders of the River? Paul Robeson, you know, right? He, he really regretted making that film as you're real to watch it. But, but um, that, that question is so interesting because a lot of the people like William Sellers uh, were amateur filmmakers. You know, this was the era of the cinema camera, and they took a lot of so-called anthropological footage. And what the colonial film unit did was it invited all of the officers in all of those um, uh, like British African colonies to send their anthropological footage that they would then splice into the film. And if you watch Sanders of the River, there's a huge chunk of it which is like spliced in anthropological footage. Even though Sanders of the River is set in Nigeria, this footage is from the Maasai region. It's, like, it's this safari park, there's, there's gazelle and elephants, and it's a kind of safari flyover in a small white aircraft that's been spliced back in to give this kind of African authenticity to, to the film. Now, that's a film for a uh, Western um, consumer. The, the, the kind of anthropological footage that was, that was given to the colonial film unit, it, it was used, but it was used in this way to try and um, to try and draw audiences in to that that thought of the sort of that, that kind of message about dirt and hygiene. So, so so there's some yeah you know there's there's, a, there's quite a few films have that. I think the, as you'll have gathered, the filmmakers were very controlling about content, and um, they needed to give particular messages. And very often it was around um, remapping people's lifestyles. So you didn't necessarily want the type of kind of footage that those officials were taking because you wanted to give a different message. Very often, but in a lot of these films, you get the so-called um, progressive African leader who is, so in, in The Wives of Nendi, it's Maima Gwendi, who's the wife of the leader, are seen as very progressive, and they're the ones that introduce the, you know, so it's via these kind of African mouthpieces these messages are, are disseminated. So, so they didn't really make that much use of the actual anthropological footage. <coughs> but but there's, there, again, there's a wonderful archive. You know, there's all kinds of photographs. You get lots of, in, in Rhodes House Library in Oxford, lots of big albums of photos. And there's, there's, some, there's some interesting footage as well. So that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Steph, thank you for your lecture. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was wondering, when you were talking at the beginning about colonial traders, uh, traders um, reports of cleanliness, did it matter what class they came from uh, in how they saw dirt? That's another brilliant question. So a lot of the white traders in West Africa were um, running away from poverty. In, the, in British inner cities. There were a lot of people from Liverpool, a lot of people from Manchester, and they went out to, um, to West Africa in order to become produce traders, you know, to bring um, raw materials out from the, the interior of Africa and then export those and, and exchange those for goods that they imported. Um, so most of, those, most of those traders were working class men, um, largely. I'm not sure about uh, Thomas Malcolm Knox, who travelled with Lever, um, he was a subordinate to Lever, obviously, he, but he was a, a, clerical, a clerical class. Um, 
I think he was slightly better educated than some of the others, but certainly the, um, there's a lovely archive. Again, Rose House Library in Oxford has got a lot of these trader, um, a lot of them handwritten diaries and journals where, where people are really attempting to interpret their environment. And in a way, I think one of the things I want to say at this point to, to make more complex what I've said in the lecture is that that, 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 that idea about dirt, it's an effort to interpret the other, and it is also a failure of interpretation. So, so dirt marks the failure of interpretation of the other, as much as it is part also of a persistent reactionary discourse that is about you know, really pushing someone away, labeling them, the physical, visceral, but there is a kind of, there's a moment in a lot of those, um, those journals where there's a real curiosity about, well, why, why are that, you know, like, you, you know, the, 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 the wares laid out on the store, like little bits of this, and that they simply failed to recognize things that were circulating in local economies, and cash was being paid for those things. You know, so there's a real confusion, a sense of kind of, they're perplexed, um, and that they're perplexed because their life is trade, they need people to change their consumption habits and use uh, you know, pears, soap, etc. I actually have missed out one of the... There's a pears soap advert. If you'd like to just... I cut the last bit of the lecture because we're running out of time. Is that, is that for the round? Yeah, let's keep going. There it is. So, um, yeah, the birth of the civilization. This is a mm -hmm. pears soap advert. Right. So, you know, oh, I, I'm glad I got a chance to reminded of having that it's, um, And this, this was an advert for pears soap on the back of the Stanley edition of... Um, of a, of a journal, and it's got the consumption. I'll read this for you. The consumption of soap is a measure of the wealth, civilization, health, and purity of the people, especially for, for <coughs> pears. So, uh, so pears was very much in, in competition with the, the um, League of Rome. So, but, but this idea of a kind of you know, there's a shipwreck. The shipwreck in the background is this European voyager carrying soap. <laughs> so, bar of soap is washed up to be. <laughs> Enlightenment, because you know, this is this is kind of where I'm coming from with this idea of dirt. It's just so fascinating how, um, how you know, health is third in that list. Wealth, civilization, health, purity. So, so that's kind of veered away from your question quite a bit. But, um, but yeah, in terms of social class, it was very much working class traders in, in um, West Africa in the early years of the 20th century. But we've also got you know the colonial officials who were largely a lot better educated. I see the um, lecture. I was a bit curious of whether dirt, it was dirt or soil you were, you were going to talk about. Um, I'm just curious about the fact that in our inner cities, which were dreadful in those ti same times, whether there was film to try and coax those people to be cleaner. And instead of trying to coax them to be cleaner, to create cleaner places for them to live. Um, you couldn't do it in Africa, because Africa, I suppose, they've got a, they had a set way of living for thousands of years, and they knew what cleanliness and things like that was from their point of view. You couldn't really change it as such, but we should have been changing our own society that's how I see it, yeah. because we were probably worse. Mm. I mean, the, seeing those people being made to sweep up, the, that rubbish was probably there, put there, for them to sweep up. The nice soil um, workers, be, right? Um, the, um, the rubbish before the tea party. Uh -huh. um, because those people are cleaning up all the time, aren't they? They don't, they don't leave things in a mess. Because well, uh, they have to live in it. Absolutely, and one of the, you know, I'm really sorry I couldn't get to talk more about that, but, but I've looked at all the kind of colonial public health archive and all of these sanitary measures, you know, that I spoke about how many ordinances and rules and regulations of work were put in place. Um, in a way, those rules and regulations produced the very dirt that they were designed um, to prevent. So, latrines, let's talk about those, right? The, the, the spots for latrines, um, People were then required to visit those latrines. Now, if you've got an overcrowded city, you saw how few public latrines there were, right? So those then become places of disease, places of infection. It almost, and, and then in terms of housing as well, so the, the traditional African hut with a straw roof. Again, that map showed where straw, one of those maps shows where, where straw huts are prohibited because they were seen as dirty, vermin-infested, rats would come in. Okay, so, so those, those huts were replaced by... Um, 
Breeze Brook and corrugated iron square dwellings rather than a circular hut in space, um, which got extremely hot, as you can imagine, and were built almost to duplicate <coughs> the very so-called slum conditions from the British inner cities. So, so you're absolutely right in your interpretation of it. And, and one of the things that I've been, I'm calling it, you know this idea of reading against the grain? I'm calling it reading against the drain. <laughs> but all this sanitary, all this sanitary legislation, just <coughs> because it was, because the infrastructure was so poor, these, you know, the, the drains weren't built uh, in a way that extended to the whole city, and yet people were obliged to use particular latrines. So it actually, from an epidemiological point of view, from a public health point of view, it was far cleaner, safer to go and defecate either on the shoreline, if you had a shoreline, or in the bushes, it's called, you know, open spaces, than it was to go to one of these few filthy toilets that, that you were legally obliged to use in the cities. And, and you know, that, that, that just, you see that again and again in these documents of how, how you know, this kind of well-meaning sanitation <coughs> energy legislation that is very much drawn from the problem of British inner cities, plus malaria, which is a whole nother topic, really interesting, but, but you, you know, that, that you actually get the kind of production of the problem. I mean, I'm overstating it slightly, but, but not too much. It's a, you know, and that local people's responses, in a way, as with their responses to the films, local people's responses was just to ignore it, walk away, carry on as before. And even with the interviewees that, um, you know, I'm so sorry I didn't get a chance to talk about those 200 interviewees from contemporary, particularly the Legotians, but, um, you know, a lot of people, they prefer the pit latrine <coughs> where everything goes into compost. To, you know, to the bucket, removable bucket with no water to put, you know, that, so, so um, you get these, these kind of contradictions are in the archive and, and you, you're absolutely right to, um, to interpret it in that way. Okay, question. Gentleman over here. Um, I just had a question about a word that's on the screen right now, actually, about purity. Um, so during this era, then obviously what we saw as dirty was things which was to do with soil and which weren't fabricated in factories. But I feel like recently we've had sort of a reversal where this word natural is very important and things which are natural are seen as pure and things which come from factories, things which even have been disinfected. If it's been done with chemicals, which are frightening, it's seen as in some way soiled in a way that things which come <coughs> from earth are seen as pure. I've, we've almost had a reversion of that. And I was just wondering if you looked into that at all, of why things have flipped recently to see um, things which are produced and artificial as more intimidating and contaminated, and things which are from the earth as pure again. I think that would make an amazing project. I really do. I, I mean, in a way, in a way, I think, you know, we're all, we are the products of our times, and I think that my perspective for this entire project has been a eco-critical or environmentalist perspective. And so what I've tried to do, which I'm sort of making a confession here because, um, you know, one's supposed to be objective and to sort of put the evidence together, etc. But I think what I've done is I've made a particular reading of, um, of Nigerian history, in <coughs> particular the history of Lagos, in order to, 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 to almost like a lament of the possibilities that were erased by this kind of um, colonial regime and the type of infrastructure that it brought with it because of exactly what you're saying. Because you know, time and again, you see examples, again, it's having to read against the grain at this time of those, those colonial narratives. But you, know, you just see, you see examples of, um, of, of lovely, uh, tranquil, clean, um, uh, clean as in disease-free, mud huts with they're cool in the summer and they're warm when it's cold. You know, that just so in a way, I think what I've been doing in this project is trying to sort of almost gesture towards an alternative trajectory, what might have been before the arrival of these really quite obsessional sanitation inspectors as part of the British colonial regime. So it's a kind of it's a kind of a little bit of a tragic history, I think, that that there's a sort of um, a sense of you know right back through a hundred years of research, you see. You see the sort of you see the persistence of all of those African ways of life. You do, and they and still now, you know, even our a lot of our interviewees were saying, no, like we don't do all of that. We have a pit latrine, and we, you know, we. So, so there's a sort of current of of, 
or, um, that, that connects back to the over 100 years. But, um, but you know, the, these disruptions from the colonial sanitation regimes really, um, really did sort of yeah, dislocate a lot of, of those other kinds of lifestyle, certainly, certainly in urban areas. So, so yes, yeah, so that isn't particularly answering your question, but your question's really made me reflect on my own project. That perhaps it is a slightly, um, you know, it's a kind of slightly, uh, yes, yeah, so what might have been project as much as a, a description of what actually happened. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm going to ask you about something that's kind of not in the in the presentation, which is the stuff that's come out of the interviews, and particularly particularly thinking about Nigeria and its very rich film culture that it now has, and the, the kind of the way in which. Do you start to touch in the border project on their kind of reactions to dirt kind of more contemporarily? And how particularly <coughs> filmically that plays back to these previous movies and, 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 and that some of those moments I'd be interested to know. Could I have a, one of those free lecture slots later in the time? <laughs> <laughs> I've given you the first half of the project and the second half of the project is about exactly exactly that. And you know, there's a whole I don't know if people heard of Nollywood movies. A lot of you will have done, yeah, Nollywood. So um, there's, there's lots of, there's hundreds, there's thousands of Nollywood movies. Um, so <coughs> the pro our project started, I won't go, I'll try not to go on too long about this, but basically our project began with the outbreak of Ebola. Um, so people were fleeing Nigeria. We were going in, it's like kind of, wow, this is interesting. How are people responding? How are people responding? And one of the things that was really, again, um, interesting and surprising from a public health point of view is that um, almost immediately uh, Nollywood movies started to get produced about Ebola. So there's a whole, there's a lot, you can watch them online actually, just type in Ebola movies. There's lots of, um, lots of Nigerian movies about Ebola. And a lot of them are comedies. You know, again, there is, there's that laughter again. And, um, and so, you know, there's a way in which the sort of, um, in which local cultural production kind of satirises, mocks, comments on, you know, there's something, you know, the, the kind of levels of laughter. And the, 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 the laughter in the Ebola movies is about, generally it's about people who are so ignorant that they do really stupid things to try and prevent themselves from getting Ebola, like drinking, like, you know, saline fluid or, you know, things that actually were, were, were going to cause far worse health <laughs> effects than, Ebola, you know, the, their exposure to Ebola. So there's, there's a way that there's a whole lot of really interesting material <coughs> in the films. And we, we certainly did talk to people about, it's, in a way the project is about, um, all the way through the project, it's about how do people locally consume and interpret mass media, um, whether that is local mass media or whether that's um, global mass media. So the, we kind of move right into thinking about, you know, how local people look at, read popular literature and newspapers and how it's not, not how they read it's how they talk about it how do how do people interpret particular kind of um particularly messages about the environment and health from the media so um and, and just i'll just on that note with the nollywood films that figure of the the charlatan healer features again and again in nollywood films so there's there's so many films where you get this kind of so-called traditional healer who's a really seen as like baddie so funnily enough, and I haven't got the expertise really to, to unpick this, but, but you know, why, why, why has that figure persisted right through that colonial archive up from the 1870s up to the present in Nollywood films? There he is again, it's always a man, you know, this kind of hocus pocus charlatan as a baddie. Um, and there certainly would be a really interesting project to do around that. I think there was a question over there, this gentleman, and then. Yeah, I wondered really whether you'd compared what you were looking at in terms of sort of current, the way, and I'm very struck by some of the similarities between the, the Indian communications that I saw and their current attempts to try and control open defecation, because they don't seem to have moved on very far, really. And, and looking backwards, I wonder whether these colonialists were actually reproducing the public health message that they'd been exposed to, because actually it was a very new message, the sort of um, Florence Nightingale, miasma, cleanliness, and all that was a really... You know, it's a very short period, and it was very traumatic to the whole British society, the, the number of people they'd killed through managing this badly yeah. during the Crimean War. So I wonder whether they were basically just reproducing the very poor propaganda that they themselves had been exposed to really quite recently mm -hmm. for them. It's, yeah, there's a lot packed into your question, a lot. Um, I suppose just from the research that we did, um, 
there's some very good examples of responses to epidemics. Like there was a there was an outbreak of bubonic plague in Lagos in the 1920s that lasted for about six or seven years, and it was extremely well managed, surprisingly well managed by the the, the you know the kind of health very yeah health teams contained it. They used ancient <coughs> medieval um, medieval techniques, I suppose, of isolation. You know, checking people who were travelling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then you get the same again with the Ebola outbreak. So you get these kind of strategies that are in place for radical containment. So when I say well managed, I think I revise that to mean you know, like really, yeah, sort of, sort of closing down the entire society, stopping stopping any movement. There's a real kind of um, closure around both those epidemics. So, and then you get the public health material, which is just kind of intriguing for its difference. You know, it's just. The, the, the sort of material, these films, they just, they just don't, you know, what, what I'm, I'm interested in what people make of them. Please email me. <laughs> um, because they don't, they don't have this kind of response to bad or good, <coughs> however one sees it, to, to public health crises. They have like a lot of other information packed into them as well. That's kind of not even public health related, half of it. So, so it's almost like, you know, what you, you focused in on a health story. And I'm kind of focusing in on the sort of almost like how health goes awry in in the media. So yeah, I mean it's, it's a very interesting study. Um, yeah. In China, they have the fluid test, which only occurs in women, so it's not right. it didn't work because basically it missed out on a lot of tissue in the limb. And it, what it's doing is worsening the real impact of the disease. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. I mean you don't have to be that clever to work out that it's not good propaganda. Yeah. Well, that, can everyone hear that? Can I, yeah. can we just have last, two last questions. Um, the gentleman in the brown jacket, uh, finally, and then Emily. Just. Thank you. You have had lots of fun with the style of the public and your public health messages. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite sure that if you chose to look at the sort of public health messages that were being knocked out at the same time in this country, in the 1920s, in, I, I don't know, Huddersfield or South Shields, you could have equal fun. What you haven't told us is whether the message actually had any effect. In other words, we know that in this country, um, uh, the great effort against dirt in the area that we're talking about had a colossal effect on uh, life expectancy. Did it have any similar effect, a good or ill, in the places that you're talking about? You haven't told us. I felt like the second half of my lecture was kind of about that in terms of people, public responses to that mass media. I agree I had a lot of fun with that archive. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when, when <coughs> I, I tried to find out exactly the information that you're talking about, you know, in this really problematic archive, um, and I found a lot of laughter. I found a lot of local interpretations of particular messages that were absolutely completely <coughs> separate from the so-called public health messages. <coughs> so in a way I think I would I would reiterate the, the point made earlier, um, you know, your point actually about look, there are existing practices and existing um, kind of belief systems and existing ways of interpreting health, cleanliness, hygiene, etc. Um, into in, into which those public health messages from the colonial regime dropped. And that's the bit that sort of interests me, is then what, you know, then what happened? So I'm not a public health person, I'm, I, so I can't give you statistics and, and say, well, people's life expectancy increased. <coughs> as a result. In, you know, this, in, that information is very, very difficult to, to extract. You can find lots of information about who survived the bubonic plague and how many and then right up to the present day with Ebola, you know, there's a lot of information about how that was contained and who survived and how. But, but you know, the sort of, in a way, I think I'm, I'm kind of not, I'm not with you with your point because you're saying how did, if you clean up dirt, then life expectancy increases. And I'm kind of saying, yeah, but dirt's not really about that in this material. It's, it's about something else. It's about cultural change and moral judgment. And, Evaluations of different kinds. So, so, so I think I might be at the point of saying that 
the actual dirt, empirical dirt, stuff, or dirtiness, or however you're thinking about it, I don't, I'm not so interested in that, as in, in how it becomes a category for interpreting other people and people's behaviour, people's <coughs> lifestyles. And, and that's where I do have to sort of take my position as a humanities historian, not a scientist. So I think as a, if anyone here does work in public health, I'd be really keen to have a conversation around how we bridge, you know, how do we bridge um, the recipients of public health messages, the communities of public health messages that are aimed at, and, um, and the message itself, you know, how do people interpret public health messages? Over time. So that you know, it's a really interesting area of inquiry. Last question, please. Um, just over here. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, if you, uh, what you thought about how the um, how the health propaganda, like tours and films, would have influenced uh, African people's negotiation with biomedicine. And that was kind of like my response to your comment was maybe less to judge um, how effective they were, like statistically, but more how that kind of those messages of biomedicine were more imbued with uh, like cultural criticisms. And I'm interested in, I guess it's hard to tell, in turn how African people would have like negotiated with biomedicine. Well, if you've got a colonial regime that is imposing particular regulations on your community, um, in a number of ways, you know, like you can see from that, um, the, the film unit, that mobile film unit, you don't just have a film that's being shown, you've got, you know, you, the, the local um, community leader will be recruited uh, to give that message as well, the local school teachers will be recruited to give that message as well. So, so in terms of, you know, it's a far, it's a far more um, kind of like activity of disseminating that message than simply showing a film. Um, and that's that's where you get impact, you know, the impact of that message. So you know, constantly the colonial, and, and you know, the, it's it's not. I, th I probably was oversimplifying in talking about audiences and film because in there you've also got the whole idea of like governmentality. You know, how people were um, identified as colonial subjects, what co how, what position people had in colonial hierarchies, whether a chief of a village felt under threat. You know that he or, or pressure of any kind in order to communicate a particular public health message. The, the teacher would probably be Christian because of having got into the position of being a teacher in a school. Do you see what I mean? So that that those so that those the the, the influence the impact of those messages came through um, up through people through uh, mouthpieces for those messages as 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 much as they came through um, you know through. Through the films themselves, so so there's a whole area of like yeah effect, um, and 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 transformation as well. So you know those if you see those open air cinema spaces are um, there's like an invisible boundary which is the, the sort of the colonial regime holding people in that space with that particular message. So and 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 you know yes people were persuaded to go and take up particular public health measures, you know, going to the European hospital, for example. There were, there were lots of campaigns against local midwives. Um, and um, there, were, there were rewards for using the local hospital. But there were also, like as we were saying earlier, all these kind of contradictions around those hospitals and those spaces in terms of um, availability, <coughs> access, and, and also, you know, the, the, the kind of, the, the way that the Africans were constructed as inferior within a colonial regime. So, so in a way, like, sort of, yeah, transformation and take up has got to be part of, you know, be seen as part of that sort of that governmental package in a way. Thank you. Very was really interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I think we'd like to join the thanks stuff. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs>